many scenarios have been considered looking at what might have happened had that fatal shell not struck Hood at the Battle of the Denmark Strait in the context of the battle itself. But this then begs the question, what happens next? If Hood survives the Battle of the Denmark Strait, what is her eventual fate? Well, there are a number of options, but Hood had already been hit hard in the battle and would likely take further hits before the end of it. She was also quite badly worn out at this point. She'd stripped a turbine trying to chase down the French battlecruiser Strasbourg during the bombardment of Meurs el Kabir, and despite hasty quick refits here and there, she was really running more on hopes, prayers and duct tape than anything else at this point. Her status as the only British capital ship capable of 30 plus knots that also had the armour and weapons to go toe to toe, at least in theory, with anything she might come across, had kept her in service well after the, all the signs were there that she desperately needed work. Even pre-war, the plan had been to put her into refit in early 1942, and that had been predicated on if she'd actually last that long without breaking down. So, let us construct a scenario that changes relatively little with regards to the battle itself, and therefore the course of history remains for the moment fairly little changed. In our alternate scenario, everything works out pretty much the same as Hood begins her second turn to port. Bismarck fires her guns, the shells fly out, one plunges down on a course that leads it into the trough of the ship's bow wave, heading right for the off-machinery space below the waterline. But some minor change somewhere. A butterfly in Central Park, a cod that swam left instead of right, a wisp of cloud that changed the surface temperature on a small patch of the ocean near the Azores, whatever, means that part of the natural sea state has resulted in a natural wave just a little bit higher on the shell's path, clipping it just a couple of metres before it should otherwise have hit the water. Not too much force, just enough to drag on the lower half of the shell and just enough impact to start the fuse going. Now slightly off angle, the shell ploughs into the water, heading down toward Hood's hull. But the difference in angle of entry versus the angle of the shell itself makes it tumble very quickly. So it smashes into the hull plating, practically going sideways, slowing down rapidly even as the shell begins to disintegrate. But the fuse just about does its job, and so the shell explodes just as it's making its way through into the machinery spaces. Instantly, a hole is ripped in the ship's side and tons of water begin pouring in. Hot fragments pepper the bulkhead and pass through, starting small fires in the 4-inch magazine. But the rush of water following through from the rather more significant sized hole in the ship's side engulfs them. Most of the crew in the aft engine room are relatively mercifully killed in the blast of the shell, and water rapidly floods into here as well. The inner starboard shaft comes to a halt as power is lost. With more thrust on the port than starboard side, and a huge amount of drag from the hole, the hood lurches to starboard, almost colliding with a non-rushing HMS Prince of Wales. Fragments from the explosion have also pierced the bulkhead dividing the aft and middle engine rooms, and there's a race there to plug the holes and keep the water out, else they lose the inner port shaft as well. Up on the bridge, the loss of speed is noticed, along with the rather violent turn out of line. Reports of the damage reaching the bridge in time, but the smoke billowing from the side of the ship is testament enough. It's clear that Hood cannot keep up with the German ships as it's rapidly losing speed. Prince of Wales thunders past, and Captain Leach, seeing the flagship heeling to starboard, acts on his own initiative and deploys a smoke screen, even as his ship blazes away with an ever-varying number of guns. Gamely, Hood's own gunners add to the barrage until their target disappears behind a thick curtain of smoke. Holland now orders Hood to turn away and open the range, keeping what speed is left going is exacerbating the flooding and might soon lead to the loss of a second shaft, and fighting in this condition invites at best Hood's further battering as a sitting duck, and at worst the Germans hooking across the British T or Prince Eugen closing to torpedo range. Under covering fire and smoke from Prince of Wales, the British withdraw from combat. Aboard Bismarck, a furious argument breaks out as to whether to follow the British ships or not. 
Whilst Bismarck's captain is all for it, he is overruled. Bismarck's priority must be to fulfil its mission to hit enemy shipping. Even if damaged, there are still two capital ships out there, and Bismarck has already taken a number of hits from Prince of Wales. As the Germans draw out of range, and then out of sight, Admiral Holland orders Prince of Wales to continue the pursuit with Norfolk and Suffolk in company. Hood will limp back home in company with a flotilla of destroyers that they'd arrived with, which are just now rejoining the formation. With both inner shafts shut down to allow damage control efforts to stem the flooding and keep speed down so as not to exacerbate the issue, Hood begins the long journey home. Much of the crew is brought forward as the quarterdeck, which was never too far above the sea level, is now near enough constantly awash. Additional aid is requested from home and Holland decides to head for Iceland. It's far closer than the UK, and without some rather quick additional work, the flooding might spread. Once in Reykjavik harbour, the destroyers are able to lend a hand with pumping and Hood is in no further danger of sinking. Work continues on shoring up bulkheads and some basic work is done on trimming the hole in her side. The arrival of additional ships later that week allows a temporary patch to be welded in place and pumping efforts to clear the aft machinery space, at least partially, so that she can get underway. As this work completes, word is received that Bismarck has been sunk by Royal Navy forces far to the south. Thus buoyed, and somewhat more seaworthy, Hood heads for the mainland UK, proceeding at 12 knots so as to not unduly disturb the patching. Thus, June 1941 sees a badly battered Hood limping in, with the amount of damage to her machinery, necessitating a complete replacement of at least one set of engines, possibly two, as well as the damage to the upper works from the fire and the rather large hole in the side, there would be little reason to put her through many months of dockyard repairs and get her out in still largely worn out condition, only to then end up having to recall her months later, possibly after some kind of catastrophic failure at sea. And so it is likely that the plans for her large repair, or to be more accurate, modernisation, would need to be moved forward from the projected date of 1942. Now, it is of course entirely possible that with the wartime pressures of con on construction and repair, she might just have been patched up or partly refitted and thrown back out there relatively quickly. But given the woeful state of her engines, the mediocre state of her anti-aircraft mountings, and the massively outdated fire control systems, in this scenario, with the Lion-class battleship suspended, the urgent need for modern, fast and well-armed battleships would probably be realised. There's also an interesting confluence of events. HMS Vanguard had been ordered only three months earlier, and materials were being gathered for a projected laying down of the ship in October. Whilst Hood could not take Vanguard's place, as the latter was to be built on a slipway, much of the planned upgrades for Hood might use the same items and materials that were being gathered for Vanguard, such as the 5.25-inch secondary batteries, altered 15-inch turrets, Type 274 radar, and the like. But since Hood's hull was, well, mostly, already there, it would be quicker to modernise Hood than to build and fit out an entirely new ship from scratch, especially as this would allow the diversion of a larger amount of structural steel to other ships that needed completing fast, such as the carrier Implacable, and of course freeing up of the slipway that Vanguard was to be built on. The net result would have been to slow down work on Vanguard, but that's an issue that we'll come back to later. There is one alternate possibility here. HMS Warspite was on her way to Bremerton to spend five months getting refitted, and of course Rodney had been on her way to the US when Bismarck broke out. With the US not currently at war, but more than willing to take on good paying work, there is a chance that Hood may have been sent over the Atlantic for a time in dock, as that would be more secure from bombing and work stoppages due to lack of material. But in either case, what was actually going to happen to Hood? In the late 1930s, schemes had been drawn up which anticipated needing about three years in dock. This would mean she'd be out of action until about mid-1944, but with pre-gathered materials and a priority on the work, especially if she was in American hands, this would probably have been shortened down to around two and a half years, maybe less if some elements were left out. Now, it's important to bear in mind that no full documentation about exactly 
what was planned has survived. Or if it has, it's been filed away in some random piece of the National Archives which no one's come across yet. So the following is not conjecture, but based more on notes that have made it through rather than a full detailed plan. Nevertheless, two schemes had been proposed. They differed somewhat, but they had the following common features. The provision of new main and auxiliary machinery. The provision of either 5.25 or 4.5 inch dual purpose mounts. The removal of all existing armament apart from the 15 inch guns in order to facilitate said dual purpose mountings. Additionally, the provision of six Mark VI pom-pom eight barrel mounts. Removal of the remaining torpedo tubes. Provision of a catapult, hangars and aircraft similar to King George V. Removal of the conning tower, because no one used it, and the reconstruction of the bridge and superstructure. Modifications to underwater protection, including the removal of the crushing tubes from her bulges. Provision of increased deck armour. Removal of the upper 5-inch armour belt. Modifications to the top portion of the bulge in order to provide the stability necessary to support all these changes. And the extension of the aft section of the forecastle deck, which would hopefully partially cure the quarter deck issues that had occurred in any sea state other than a flat calm. The main differences centred around what was to be done with the ship's armour. Scheme A would see the 7 inch belt replaced with the 12 inch belt being extended all the way to the upper deck, with 2 inches added to the existing upper deck throughout the citadel which would provide a total of 7 inches of deck armour in two layers above the magazine, not including the 1.5 inch uppermost deck plating which was primarily in place to deal with bombs by detonating them early. Scheme B retained the 7 inch belt and thus had a shorter or shallower 12 inch belt. The deck armour present at the changeover point between the 12 and 7 inch belts would be increased to 5 inches over the magazines and 4 inches over the machinery. In both schemes the machinery spaces would be further subdivided and speed would be about 31 and a half knots at standard displacement and just over 30 knots at deep displacement. The modifications to the underwater protection would include the aforementioned removal of the crush tubes from the buoyancy spaces in the bulges with oil fuel in the existing wing tanks being transferred to these vacated areas which would also give the hood a slightly increased amount of range. Due to all this added weight above the waterline stability would decrease and that would be countered by alterations to the upper part of the bulges. Scheme A with the greater belt armour was weaker than Scheme B against bomb hits amidships, but by adding a bit of deck armour here and there, about 80 tonnes worth all told, Scheme A was then preferred over Scheme B as it was held that the following applied. Firstly, the existing barbette armour was weak below the upper deck, and a thick upper deck would be necessary to cover these weak spots. Secondly, a better side protection and armoured stability was present in Scheme A, and in this scenario given she'd just been in a gunfight, and that would have been on the minds of many officers. Thirdly, the protective deck was one deck higher than in Scheme B, which would give her better protection against bombs as they detonate higher in the ship. And fourthly, in Scheme B, the ship would still have the 7-inch upper belt, which would be about 750 tonnes of useless dead weight, since it was too thin to resist any serious incoming fire the ship might encounter if it was facing off against similarly gunned opponents. Following the then-current British doctrine regarding removal of the conning tower and rebuilding the complex bridge and mast structure would provide more space for command staff and, of course, new support for features like radar, whilst saving another 600 tonnes of vital high-mounted weight, since, as we said, no one used the conning tower anyway. The hodgepodge of AA armament would be replaced with the six octuple pom-poms and the dual-purpose secondary battery, and the removal of the torpedo tubes would also save weight that could be better used elsewhere. The extension to the forecastle deck, as well as keeping the quarter deck dry, would also have provided much-needed space higher in the ship for the crew. Of course, the new machinery would also save weight and allow more space deep in the ship for additional storage and other new equipment to be installed. 
At the same time, there would be a debate over the number and type of secondary battery. Her sheer length might allow for a renowned or Queen Elizabeth style refit using 10 twin 4.5 inch mounts, or maybe even 12. But on the other hand, the improved 5.25 inch mounts for Vanguard would already be in train, and therefore would probably be a more attractive proposition than diverting large numbers of 4.5 inch guns from the carriers and other ships. Therefore, the secondary battery is more likely to have been the eight improved twin 5.25 inch turrets. Aircraft facilities are another interesting factor, but I believe they would have been retained. HMS Howe was completed with these features, Lion and Temeraire had been planned with them, and historically Vanguard only had these eliminated from her redesign in late 1941 after another revision. Now, whilst arguably there would have been time before the superstructure was built up again in this scenario, I think the pressure to get things going at a fast pace would have mitigated against such a revision, since whilst simply not installing aircraft facilities sounds easy, a lot more work would have been needed to work out what to then do with the resulting space. Although it's also possible that the hangars might have just been left in the design, and the aircraft just not placed inside them, and the launching facilities fitted again to save weight and time, with the hangar spaces then just being generically used by the crew or for storage. One thing that would have changed is the light and medium anti-aircraft battery. Whilst 48 pom-pom barrels and the 5.25 inch guns would have been a great armament to have in 1941, the loss of Prince of Wales and Repulse and the upswing in air attacks generally would likely have seen progressive layers of 20mm Orlikon and 40mm Bofors added to the ship with each year that it's spent in dock. The new radar, fire control systems and modified main battery turrets may have changed specifications slightly, but this would largely have likely consisted of simply installing the updated version of the radar or similar systems instead when it came time to actually do so. Now, whilst it is very tempting to imagine a full speed refit getting her back in time just about to face off against Scharnhorst at the Battle of the North Cape. That would mean repair, refit, recommissioning, and back into service in just under two and a half years. Possible, but unlikely, unless significant corners were cut. More likely, she's going to be back with the fleet in early to mid-1944. But at this point, the war would have changed rather dramatically. All German capital ships would now be long gone, with the exception of the half-crippled Tirpitz in Norway. The Italian fleet has surrendered, and thus the only enemy Hood would have left would be the Imperial Japanese Navy in the Pacific. Fresh, fast, and extensively armed with a large and very considerable anti-aircraft battery, her most likely role would thus have been as a core part of the then-growing British Pacific fleet likely as flagship, as she would have the space for the Admiral's staff and the speed to keep pace with the carriers. Sadly, this would mean that she is not likely to see any action against other capital ships, unless some major butterflies see a surface action develop around Operation Tengo in 1945, but she would see out the war as an escort to the fleet carriers with occasional shore bombardment duty thrown in. Her sheer size would likely also have made her a prime target for kamikazes off Okinawa, which her new anti-aircraft battery and extensive armour protection would have made her well equipped to deal with, drawing fire from the carriers and possibly sporting a fetching white tropical paint scheme. Post-war, her fate would be quite interesting. With Vanguard still likely far from complete, it's questionable as if the latter ship would be finished as a battleship. Plans for a carrier conversion had been mooted before, and now with her hull probably maybe partially complete, but most of her actual gun and sensor systems aboard Hood, who would be freshly modernised and critically much faster than the King George V class and thus better suited for carrier escort operations, it's likely Hood would have taken Vanguard's historical place as the active British battleship in the 1950s, possibly even operating alongside HMS Vanguard, which may now be in its new role as the Royal Navy's latest carrier. Her survival beyond that point is questionable. The naval enthusiast in me wants to say that with her greater fame and survival past the 1940s, some movement toward keeping her as a museum ship could have been made, but at the same time the realist in me suspects the breakers' yards in the 1960s would have been more likely, perhaps with some elements of her being preserved in a land-based museum. <laughs> 
There is, of course, also the remote possibility of the carrier vanguard conversion being the one to be modernised instead of HMS Victorious, this relatively easier job saving enough money to see Hood sent to the reserves instead of the breakers, and then maybe, just maybe, called up for action in a last hurrah with the fleet sailing to the Falklands in 1982. I mean, one can dream, after all. Now, in last week's video on why the hood blew up, there are a lot of questions, shall we say. Um, but since it's going to probably be a month or two before I get round to actually catching up to that particular episode in the dry dock, I thought I should probably answer some of the more commonly asked questions about the parameters of the research and the calculations, etc. So I thought I'd do that now. Um, so there's at least some proximity to when those questions are asked. The most common questions seem to be around the 7-inch plate, the penetration of that, the angle range alignment of the ship, the angle of roll, um, how far along it was in the turn, was the armour operating at full proper quality, was there any deflection of the shell, etc, etc. So... I'll try and cover those particular subjects in brief. So, loosely in reverse order, did I account for the shell possibly deflecting if it penetrated one of the armour plates? In the diagrams, no, um, that wasn't shown, but that's because shell deflection is... it's a known quantity, but the exact degree to which it occurs in any particular given scenario is to a certain degree random. There's equations that will tell you what will happen, but there are so many variables that it'll only give you a rough spread of results. And I was trying, as I mentioned in one of the, uh, my replies to one of the comments, I was trying to be as generous as was reasonable to the various theories that I was going through and saying, well, actually, I don't think this is very likely. And if you do account for deflection or normalization in the case of penetration as it's sometimes called um of the shell off of its original course when it passes through the belt that actually makes the situation worse for the idea of a shell punching through the seven inch belt because the chances are it would it would tend towards more of a perpendicular orientation which would in turn mean that its pa onward passage would more likely be a slower b more in pieces and C much more likely to skip off the armor deck. So yeah, it, it's it's a thing that does happen, um, but the circumstances under analysis really don't allow for it to make too much difference other than just to push the possibility slightly further back into a box. In terms of armor quality, now this is an interesting one. It's like some people say, well, can you could you guarantee that the actual armor quality of the steel and the rivets and everything were fully up to spec? No, you can't guarantee one hundred percent that everything on the ship is going to be homogenous. But again, um, when it comes to the statistics involved, there's there's just too much of a gap. Even if the twelve inch armor plate was say because it was Krupp style face hardened steel even if it was the worst possible example that you could reasonably expect of Krupp face hardened steel the shell still wouldn't go through that 12 inch plate um, they would have literally have had to done something like accidentally somehow installed a plate of low to low middling quality Harvey plate in order for that shell to penetrate at the angle and distance against the thickness that it you would be considering. So armor quality seems to be a fairly unlikely influencing factor in this particular case. Now the turn, that is a, a much, much more interesting one because as was established in the video and as some people pointed out, Hood's rudders were turned to port indicating it had begun at that final turn, that final two blue signal that was flying. And that would influence quite dramatically the angle of impact that the shell uh, hit at. 
and that would change things quite a lot. I mean, if the if the ship had completed its turn, so it's presenting much more of a broadside and, of course, would have got slightly closer, then the odds of a 15-inch shell penetrating clean through the 12-inch armor plate go up quite a lot. However, um, again, as I covered in uh, in the opening part of the video, there are a number of factors which mean that I believe Hood either hadn't physically begun turning at all or had barely only just begun um, and obviously you can go back and listen to the first part of the video if you want the, the full bit detail but in brief it comes down to two issues one is that the ship has inertia you can you put the wheel over and it's going to take 10 12 seconds or so before the ship actually starts to turn uh, the speed and with the hull form that hood has so the fact that the survivor who came from the bridge says, well, we'd just begun the turn to port, um, combined with the fact that the two blue signal was still flying, so it hadn't been hauled down, um, so the order to execute hadn't been given, that means they can't have been well into their turn. So the angle wouldn't have changed dramatically, because if they had been well into their turn, then that two blue execute signal would have come down and the survivors accounts would have said we were part way through the turn not we had just started the turn when the flash came up now on top of that you've got the fact said that the signal wasn't actually hauled down and with that inertia it seems more likely to me that what's being described there in that survivors account is that the the wheel has gone over the order to make the turn has been given but there's that gap in time before with that actually happening on the bridge and then the signal coming down and some people on Prince of Wales beginning to see some kind of movement from Hood and that seems to me to really box it into a matter of maybe five to ten seconds which is kind of just at the end of that inertia phase uh, when the ship is hit which means that as I said, that I don't think, although the rudder, yes, definitely is locked in a turn to port and Hood was technically beginning her turn to port, I do not think she'd really changed her direction all that much, if at all. Related to that, people have asked about the roll. Partly, obviously, if she'd been in the turn, then she would have been healing to starboard, which would have changed the angle of her um, armour. And more generally obviously ships do roll somewhat in in the sea so could that roll have changed things because as people noted and as i noted in the video um assuming a level playing field quite literally um the progress of a shell that hits just at the very bottom of the seven inch armor plate only just clips the horizontal deck armor so a few degrees one way or the other um might be enough for the shell to get in and hit the uh, sloping part of the deck armor which would be a much easier penetration so you can make that kind of supposition but there are a few problems with that the main one is it's just such a random factor i mean the the what i see is the most likely theory is already in and of itself kind of a one in a billion shot and that's just a case of well location you, you've got this target you're shooting at it the gunnery officer on bismarck schneider it's excellent gunnery officer he manages to get his uh you, without a radar bear in mind manages to get the bismarck salvos on target very very quickly and then it is a little bit of a matter of roll the dice and see where you hit you could hit the bridge you could hit a funnel you could hit somewhere relatively meaningless like an anchor chain store or you could hit somewhere that makes the ship go up go kaboom um and obviously he got sort of rolled the natural 20 of uh, naval gunnery there but that's one factor in the probability of things whereas if you then go for and also the ship would need to have been rolling and be or healing and be at this exact position in order to enable a thing that normally it wouldn't because bearing in mind you've got the level position then you've got any roll to port um, which would make things 
even worse and even harder for the shell, except for if the ship was rolling slightly to port, it would raise the lower um, the lower edge of the armor higher, which would make it actually the shot that I kind of advocate for somewhat easier to accomplish. Um, but penetration through the seven inch belt and then the deck would become a lot harder. And then you've got a slight roll to starboard, which wouldn't have enough of an effect to change things. And then you've got a slightly greater roll to starboard. So it's only that somewhat greater roll to starboard that actually then has the effect whereby a penetration through the seven inch plate could occur and make it through into somewhere vital through the sloped part of the deck armor. And that is introducing yet another factor because not only have you now got to hit in the right location albeit that the in this theory the location has now moved you've also got to hit at precisely the right time whereas with the under the armor theory you could hit that location at pretty much any time as long as hood is traveling at high speed um it's just a matter of getting the location right whereas location and this very narrow time window yet yeah, in theory but um, the odds of that just go stratospheric, really. Um, I did probability and statistics as part of my en uh, engineering maths course. And yeah, once you start trying to work out the statistical probability on that, that's just like, no, 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 no. That's <laughs> run away. Um, I mean, yeah, it, there's a, there is a slight possibility of it happening, but it makes everything else look va vastly more likely. Um then you've got the range, and again, I did mention that the range is one of these things that is in massive dispute amongst people who have studied um, Hood's destruction for quite a considerable amount of time. And no two figures exactly agree. Obviously, we don't actually know what range Hood thought she was at because all the records on Hood went boom with the ship. We do know the range that Prince of Wales thought that she was at, and both to Hood and to Bismarck. We know the range that Prince Eugen thought that she was at to Hood, Bismarck, and Prince of Wales. And to a certain degree, we know what Bismarck thought she the range was between her and Prince of Wales and Hood. Um, although, obviously, again, because Bismarck would later be sunk, not as many uh, records, at accurate sort of written records from Bismarck, so <laughs> as might otherwise be desired for this kind of discussion. But none of them agree, um, which is unhelpful, but not entirely unsurprising. I mean, uh, considering a much more prosaic uh, shooting in battleship on battleship terms of Massachusetts versus Jean Bar. Jean Bar was completely stationary. Massachusetts was the only thing that was moving. So you think, well, this would be much easier. Massachusetts has two main logs detailing her course and speed and ranges. And even those two records on board the same ship don't agree as to what it was doing. So, yeah, and, and it's not really a knock on any particular given crew because everything um, in World War II at this point is being done by largely optical range finding and dead reckoning. So there is always going to be some kind of error creeping in. So we can't take any one particular ship's figures as absolutely definitive. We have to make estimates. We have to make best, the kind of best guesses in these kind of situations. And the reason that I took the upper band of the most commonly agreed range band of around about 19,000 yards is because it seems to make the most sense of all the given potential ranges. At least to me. I mean, obviously, as I said, other people may disagree. And yes, changing the range would affect how things work. However, um, when you're considering the, if you like, plunging fire theories, making the range closer actually does pretty much rules them out entirely because the closer the range, the shallower the fall of shot and the the numbers that you need to penetrate deck armor just go up into impossible ranges. I mean, a penetration of the uh, seven inch belt at three, four, five thousand yards closer. Sure, Bismarck's got the penetration to more than enough punch through, but it had that at nineteen thousand yards. It had that considerably further out as well. 
but the f angle of the fall of shot decreases so quickly. I mean, it's five, just over 16,000 yards. You're down to just over 10 degrees, less than that, and you start entering single digits of degrees, at which point practically any level of shot against the 7-inch the plate is just going to go straight off the, the deck armor. And the other thing is that even if you come up with some kind of scenario whereby the shell either does or penetrate or avoids the deck armor at a 10 degree angle of fall the fuse is obviously going to be activated by hitting the seven inch belt it it just can't drop far enough quick enough before the fuse detonates so yeah um that's why i kind of discounted some of the closer ranges because they don't really affect anything as far as my theory goes, but they do really start to throw up some rather interesting problems for most of the others. Now, fair enough, you can argue things like hot fragments setting things off um, from the shell exploding higher up in the ship, but again, you're adding an extra layer of difficulty to a situation and thus vastly increasing... Um, the long odds, as it were. And the other problem, which is, from an engineering perspective for me, one of, if not the biggest problems with a shell coming in through the 7-inch plate in whatever manner you want to look at it, is the way Hood was destroyed. So we've already got to account for this very unusual flare-up around the base of the main mast, which is not typical of ships whose magazines go up. Um, that is something which almost near as certain means that the culprit is probably the 4-inch magazine initially, and also the 4-inch magazine having some kind of access to the machinery spaces through some kind of damaged or ruptured bulkhead. So that's that's already a thing that's in place. That in and of itself pretty much rules out a direct hit to the magazines, the 15-inch magazines, because if it was a direct hit to the 15-inch magazines, you would expect to see that flash come up around through the turrets first, not through the main mast, because you've got the ammunition hoists and such going up through the barbette. Yes, they're anti-flash doors, but I can guarantee you the anti-flash doors um, in the ammunition hoist are going to offer far less resistance to a magazine detonation than having to punch through at least two bulkheads, i.e. the ones on either side of the 4-inch ammunition magazine, and then up through the ventilation shafts in the aft engine space. And also, obviously, the expanding gases would have to fill each of those spaces um, and then shoot up. So... Yeah, a direct magazine detonation, you're not going to get that flare-up around the main mast first. Some people have made some comparisons with Arizona, but as and when I get round to doing a video on the destruction of Arizona, I will cover why the circumstances are quite different in terms of the overall layout of the ship and the locations of the explosions. But the other factor is related to that flare-up. If the shell had come in through the seven inch plate the seven inch plate is obviously above water it would have created a open tract through the ship to the four inch magazine where the four inch magazine is being set off and as the flare up around the main mast shows there was quite the conflagration that was jetting quite the the, the amount of fire out of the ship if there was a 15-inch or slightly larger hole through the 7-inch plate and then down through the ship to the 4-inch mainmast, the flare-up would have followed that line as well. And what would that have meant? It would have meant that more than likely at least someone on Prince of Wales would have spotted a near horizontal or at least somewhat diagonal spurt of flame or jet of fire coming out of the side of Hood just before the big explosion. Now, 
okay, there is a very, very, very remote possibility that maybe that happened and every everybody missed it because everyone was focusing on the much bigger column of fire up the main mast. But given how many people were interviewed, the fact that no one saw and mentioned that is, yeah, that's a, a little bit uh, of a clue to me that that probably wasn't occurring. Whereas with the uh, shell theory that I've gone for, where the shell dips under the main belt, that at least has the benefit that by going partly through the water, a short distance through the water, the actual hit itself is underwater, which means you're going to have the sea coming in through the hole the shell has formed, which obviously is going to have a lot of force coming one way, which would tend to block and counter the force of the explosion coming the other way, and thus the explosion would be vented upwards and you don't get a jack of flame coming out of the side, at least before everything goes boom and everything's obscured anyway. So that to me, suggests that perhaps the penetration of the seven inch belt is less likely. As I say, it's all other factors aside, and we've gone over in the past few minutes a number of them, but I think this is the thing is if a penetration of the seven inch belt and then the deck armor, etc., was to occur, it would require a much, much more convoluted set of circumstances which wouldn't just revolve around the location of the hit it would also revolve around the absolute precise timing of the hit and even then even assuming we had wave away some of the other issues it would also mean that absolutely everybody had missed a rather unusual horizontal or sort of near enough horizontal jet of flame coming out the side of the hood which i think someone would have picked up on um, especially given the angle that Prince of Wales was at relative to Hood, they would have had like a front row seat to it. And so that combination of factors makes me think it's it's far less likely of a scenario. Now, of course, if you subscribe to a view where the angle of Hood or the range of Hood is very different to what I described, then sure, those, those factors might change the overall probability of things. But I... I think as I've gone over here and I went over in the video, I chose the angle and range that I wanted to examine the events of Hood's destruction on based on the evidence, which I'm sure many other people have also reviewed. But that those were my conclusions, that the Hood was at the angle that I stated and that the Hood was roughly at the range um, that I stated. So, as I said, people are free to <laughs> disagree. Obviously, I, apart from anything, I can't reach through the internet and force people to change their minds. Um, but hopefully that brings a little bit more clarity and explanation to some of the reasoning behind uh, last week's video. And hopefully you can see where I'm coming from. Uh, so yeah, look forward to hearing more comments down below and hopefully some comments as well about what they think about Hood as she might have been. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.